So, we've given Rio the spotlight, dug a little deeper on Andy, taken a look at Robert, covered Adele. So now, it's time to make a video on the main man himself. After all, I am literally the Terry guy, so this is long overdue. You know, my main goal with these videos is to offer insight on characters you can't really find anywhere else, and there's plenty of videos about Terry on YouTube already. Thing is though, I feel that these videos just tell the very basic cliff notes of the story and don't really go any further. Terry dad die, Terry did this, Terry won that, Terry slapped this. I want to go a little deeper. What's he thinking? What are his goals and motivations and how do they change throughout the series? Because they always ask who is Terry Bogard, but never how is Terry Bogard. Because man like me, the world's biggest Fatal Fury fan, I notice a few inconsistencies, a few weird things that stick out. Things that could use some clearing up and explaining. Through nothing but sheer lack of friends and social life, I've studied him hard enough to come up with the answers to those things. But before I completely embarrass myself by publicly revealing how high my Terry Bogard power level is, I think it'd be a good idea to go over just why I make these videos and what my thought process is. I was wondering to myself recently what I find so engaging about SNK characters. Like I'm sure a lot of people have watched videos like my AOF3 or Andy ones and thought, why would you look so deep into a fighting game? Or even disregarded the notion that fighting game characters can or should be laid in the first place. But I think them being fighting game characters is what makes me gravitate toward them. Since they hail from a genre so restrictive when it comes to story or dialogue, it's a lot easier to build headcanons around them without any concrete lore immediately shooting them down. I know the phrase headcanons has a negative connotation to it because of how a lot of people go batshit insane with the idea and attach random attributes to characters, but I'm using it more in the sense that you come up with a new idea that you think makes a character more interesting or deep using canonical information to back it up. Pretty much like what I did with the Andy video, even if some of the ideas I have can be a bit of a stretch, I always try and explain how I came up with them. Another thing, since these games are such decaying old crusty pieces of shit, their stories are told in a pretty primitive way. You might think that detracts from the experience, and, and it does kind of, but for me it's a lot of fun to imagine how the story could be adapted and how its characters could be transformed from one-dimensional fighters into fully-fledged characters. Stuff like that is why Archie Mega Man is pretty much my favourite video game adaption of all time. Also, Jesus Christ, I already feel like I've said characters too much in this video. Is there anything else I can say? Let's see, um... Ah, perfect. Remember in the Art of Fighting 3 video when I said I didn't think I could get anything out of Robert? He just seems like such a basic and surface level dramatis personae. I really had to zero in and pay attention to the source material and try and figure out what the fuck is going on in those weird ass SNK endings before I managed to sort of understand his character arc. And once again, all I can do is speculate and everything I say is basically conjecture. But I pride myself on at least not pulling shit out of my ass. For reasons I won't disclose, I've got reason to believe I've been on the right track a couple of times. And final preface thing to note, SNK has to get clever with its way of conveying character development or personalities. Think about how old arcade modes are structured. It's just fight after fight. It's not conducive to storytelling. You can't just stick in a 15 minute long monologue or cutscene in the middle of rounds, nor can you weave the natural storyline where every character in the game is fighting in all these different locations for some reason. So the devs need to be able to tell you everything about a character through their animations and sound clips. And that will finally bring me around to the subject of the video, Terry Bogard. This guy is a prime example of communicating a character's personality through visual design. As you might expect, I have a lot to say about Terry, and a lot of it is derived from things as simple as round wind poses, or simply by how he looks in various screens or something. So you're either going to leave this video thinking I'm a total idiot or a genius. Yeah, either is fine, as long as you subscribe. Now, in order to back up my claims and theories and just the garbage that I'm going to be spewing out of my mouth in general, I'm only going to source canon Fatal Fury titles. Anything from Special or Real About Special or Real About 2 are out of the question. However, I will use material from the OVAs because I assume that they were, in some form, mandated by SNK to not stray too far. I'll even reference the motion picture, but only to draw conclusions about Terry's personality from its depiction of him, because the actual story can go die in a non-canon fire. I hate that shit, dude. But that's a topic for another video. I'm also not going to include anything from the Fatal Fury mangas, because of the two I know about, one is very obscure and the other... Well, I've seen some people swear by it, but it looks like a Dragon Ball offshoot to me. Again, a lot of it is speculation. I can't say for sure if any of what I'm about to say is what SNK truly intended or is accurate to what the company believes Terry Bogard is supposed to be. I'm not pretending to be some authority on this shit, but without any further ado, let's get into it. Terry Bogard was born on March 15th, 1971. Now, depending on whether you subscribe to the John Sex Cinematic Universe or not, he is either the son of Jeff Bogard or was orphaned by unknown parents. Either way, he and his younger brother Andy were raised by the single father Jeff Bogard. Why would Jeff take in two random children? 
Well, he wouldn't. Regardless, Jeff was a student of Hakyo Kosekin under Tung Fu Ru, an unusual fighting style that incorporates channeling ki to use in tandem with the practitioner's other martial art of choice to increase their move's effectiveness. A fellow pupil of Tung's was Geese Howard, whom Jeff respected as a brother. They trained peacefully for years until the end of their training would begin a rift between them forever. Traditionally, the school of Hakyo Kosekin always taught a secret final technique from master to only one of their disciples, Senpu Kyaku, where the user squats down like they were about to take a nasty shit and starts spinning around creating a tornado around them. Along with looking very silly, this technique is apparently extremely strong, and as we know, Jeff was chosen by Tongo over Geese to learn it. Upon getting wind of his decision, Geese rebelled and stole the scrolls of Hakyoko Seiken in order to learn it himself. What he didn't realise though, is that the final technique was only taught orally, in order to prevent this exact kind of situation from happening. In a rage of jealousy, Geese would abandon his training and move his way to the top of the South Town's crime world. Once he had enough leverage over South Town's police force and legal system, he assassinated Jeff in front of his two children. Tung concedes that with the power Geese has over the city, there's no way they'd be able to do anything about Jeff's death. He advises Terry and Andy to go their separate ways and reconvene in 10 years once they're strong enough to avenge their father. Andy goes off to Japan to train under Hanzo Shiranui, I'm assuming upon Tung's recommendation because he doesn't really have any reason to go there otherwise, while Terry decides to leave leave Southtown and wander America himself. We don't know for sure how far Terry actually strayed from Southtown in his travels or why exactly Tung let a defenseless 10 year old roam America randomly, but maybe he was just too damn old to keep up with the rebellious kid. For some reason I've always assumed Terry stayed in Southtown with Tung, but looking at all the interpretations of Terry's backstory, I don't really know where I got this idea. I just think that I really like the thought of these guys Bab Terry jobs to in the second OVA being Kyokugenri practitioners. So obviously they'd be in Southtown. I also just think the idea of Terry roaming the city that his father's murderer has corrupted for years is cool. But personal preferences aside, Terry can likely leave Southtown. Anyway, this is where things begin to get confusing, because this plot plays out a little differently across all its adaptions. And since I'm a complete stickler for details, I have to make it all make sense and be satisfying, just like the Art of Fighting 3 video, so I'm going to be making assumptions or tweaking canon just a bit in order to tell what I believe is the most satisfying version of Terry's story. The biggest variable is the existence of a female character. In the games, there is no girl in Terry's backstory. In the Fatal Fury OVA, there's Lily Maguire, who is a decent character and plays off Terry nicely, and in KOF Destiny, there's Angelina, who takes up so much screen time and is even there in the final battle with Geese. Like, fuck off! Thank you, Geese! So why am I even bringing all this up? Shouldn't I just be covering the actual video game canon? Ordinarily I would, but the concept of a girl that who Terry at least vaguely knew during his childhood who he had run into again and build some sort of brief intimate relationship with before they die adds substance to Terry's personality later on in the series. You'll see what I mean when we get there, but what I'm going to do is just smush Lily and Angelina into one entity. I'll refer to her as just Lily for the sake of clarity, but I'm going to incorporate aspects of both characters into the story. It might seem a little confusing, but just go with me here. If I seem conflicted about this, it's because I feel like introducing a love interest to Terry and having them die off during the events of Fatal Fury 1 kind of muddies the waters and takes away from what Terry's initial motivation was, avenging his father. Hell, the first OVA also has tongue die for some reason, but like I said, it provides deeper meaning to a particular relationship Terry has later on. So I'm in two minds about it, but overall I would say having a Lily or Angelina benefits the overarching story. You may be a hardcore game canon only head, but consider the fact that every time Fatal Fury 1 gets retold, they add in a love interest for Terry, even if the games have no such entity. SNK seems to think that they play an important enough role to warrant them. So, quick backstory on her. A young orphan Lily often ran into trouble with a bunch of thugs for some reason. She was also vaguely friends with Terry during this time. After receiving an extra brutal beating by the thugs one time, she's left on the brink of death and is taken in by a younger Geese Howard. He then uses her to act as a distraction during the assassination of Jeff by having her ask him to buy her flowers, opening himself up for attack. She and Terry quickly exchange glances after the fact before she gets into Geese's car and drives off. So after a decade of training, Terry and Andy both return to Southtown in June of 1991. Sorry, I mean October of 1990? Jesus Christ, why can it never be simple? Why do I care? This doesn't matter. This is useless trivia. I'm not working for money right now. I'm not talking to a girl. I'm not building friendships. I'm not progressing my social status. I'm scrutinizing the law of an old Neo Geo game. Was this set in stone from my birth? Was I always destined to get to this point? Is this my legacy right here? 
Is this what 20 years of my life has amounted to? Was there just no stopping it? Nah, I'm just pulling your fucking leg. There's nothing more important in life than Fatal Fury Law. Never forget it. I'm gonna use my status as official SNK good boy to tamper with the canon and officially state that Fatal Fury 1 takes place in June 1991. Why? Because I like June more than October. Plus, this picture of Jeff's grave says he died on June 20th. Terry arrives in South Town a few days before his meetup with Andy is due, and re-familiarizes himself with his hometown while also trying to scrape up what information he can about geese, by asking around at bars and such. He comes across a grown-up Lily who is now dubbed Queen of South Town and is regularly pimped up by geese to appeal to the men who come to the bar or whatever. She also acts as a kind of butler to him. Terry doesn't recognize her at this time, but she realizes who he is, probably because his sense of fashion has literally not changed in 10 years. She does this little game where she throws a rose and whoever catches it can spend a night on the town with her. Of course, of course, Terry catches it and her legion of simps attack him. He defends himself, but wakes up a sleeping Joe Higashi during the chaos. The two briefly face off before the feds show up and Joe throws a table at them. The next morning, Terry finds Lily giving money to the local orphans. She laments that she's just like the orphans, all smiles for anyone with money. Terry empathizes knowing what it's like to grow up poor and without family. Lily then suspiciously gets into a shady car and leaves. All this leads to Terry starting to pick up the pieces about who she really is. Anyway, to fast forward a bit, Terry reunites with Andy and Tung. They decide to enter the upcoming KOF tourney with Joe. Shit happens. Tung chooses Terry over Andy to carry on Hakyoko Seiken's final technique. Lily gets shot by geese, etc, etc, etc. I'm not going to go super in-depth for Fatal Fury 1 or 2 because the OVAs exist and you've likely already seen them. And if you haven't, just go watch them if you're interested. They're pretty good. Thank you, Master. I'll never forget! Well, apart from that. So anyway, Terry wins KOF and ends up facing against Geese in the penthouse of Geese Tower. After a grueling match, Terry just about manages to edge Geese out using the final technique combined with his own strength, and sends Geese falling to his doom. Terry, Andy, and Joe once again go their separate ways with their own quests, ending the story of Fatal Fury 1. Now, I'm not gonna go too in-depth on the story of Fatal Fury 2. As I said, it has a great OVA adaption already. I don't really see the point in just regurgitating the main points out to you. What I want to focus on, though, is how it characterizes Terry, how he's changed from the first one, and how it sets him up for the future. See, Terry always thrived on getting his revenge. That's what got him through every day, year after year, was the thought of finally getting even. And now that he has finally fulfilled that and beat Geese hand to hand, he's lost direction. He goes back to his old lifestyle as a wanderer, taking up odd jobs and just kind of living day by day, but there's no extreme motivation for him anymore. All he knows is to continue trading, but what for? He beat Geese Howard, the villainous CEO, the strongest man in the world. There's no challenge on the horizon. That being said, he's living pretty peacefully, content with kind of just existing. But his mindset towards fighting has changed. He's unsure if there's really a point to it anymore. This shows that Terry has actually kind of regressed as a character since beating Geese, and this is only further proven when Krauser comes in and completely flips his world upside down. He gets the fuck kicked out of his shit by him, and since he's mentally grown softer since his victory over Geese, Terry has forgotten how to take defeats in stride like he used to. His loss against Krauser completely shatters him, and he turns to the bottle. It's almost funny how absolutely cunted Terry gets after losing to Krauser. He just completely crumbles and loses his way. I mean, shit, he jobs to Jack from Art of Fighting. That is sad. And while it might be funny to see Terry constantly drinking in daylight and being stanced up in a prison cell, it becomes a little bit more serious when you realize something. Terry is letting his emotions rule him. He's forgetting everything Tung taught him, and is no longer worthy of the score of Hakyoko Seigen. He's become exactly like Geese, exactly what Tung warned him not to be exactly what his father wasn't. All of this brought on by just one single defeat. Even a total berating and sucker punch to the gut by Joe doesn't get him out of this funk. He's terrified of Krauser, totally embarrassed and ashamed of himself, and can't do a thing about it but drink the days away. Eventually, Terry gets his shit together, and in the OVA this is brought on by the little kid following him around, withstanding a total beating long enough to win the fight by default. This reminds Terry of his childhood and inspires him to brush himself off, put down the bottle, and rematch with Krauser. Before the match, Krauser posits that it's impossible for men like them to live without fighting, saying that they're exactly alike. I was so afraid of you. I hoped I'd never see you again. But I'm ready to fight. I've conquered my fear. Now if it kills me, you will lose. <laughs> to men like us, it is impossible to live without fighting, isn't it? We are exactly alike, you and I. While Terry emerges victorious, the fight ends with Krauser taking his own life, stating that the name of Stroheim shall not live with such shame. Krauser is just as shocked and embarrassed about his loss as Terry was at the start of the OVA, confirming what he said prior to the fight. He and Terry are exactly alike. 
Once again, Terry is left feeling empty, even after overcoming such a strong opponent. Except this time, he's even more indignant about it. And while the OVA ends with a peppy music track and a classic hat toss, it's not a very happy ending for Terry himself. Unfortunately, it's about to get a whole lot worse for him, because Geese Howard survived the fall. Biding his time and recovering his strength, Geese decided that he'd have to make a big play in order to seize control upon returning. Previously, he had stolen an ancient scroll from Tongue in Southtown. One of three, he also had access to the second scroll hidden within the walls of Stroheim Castle after Krauser's demise. These were the secret Jin scrolls, which were said to grant ultimate power and immortality to the individual who collected all three. Around two years after Terry's fight with Krauser, he and his friends are celebrating the opening of a second Peo Peo Cafe in Southtown. During the party, Joe confides in Terry that Cheng told him that rumours are going around that Geese is still alive. And sure enough, not long after, Geese announces his return and flexes that he's got two of the Jin Scrolls in an attempt to lure up the owners of the final scroll, which happened to be the ancestors of the original creators of them. Anyway, I'm not going to go over the story of Fatal Fury 3 beat by beat here. I'm sure at some point I'll find myself doing a detailed story synopsis for it, but for this video I just want to zero in on Terry himself. So with all this going on, how is he holding up? Well, this is one of those times I might be stretching a little, but doesn't Terry seem kind of pissed in Fatal Fury 3 to you? Whether it's his scale in almost all of his sprite art, or his new graver round start and win poses, or even the fact that he's just a huge cock to basically everyone throughout the game. He even has tons of sass for Joe, Andy, and Mai, who are all pretty much family to him. Now, before anyone points it out, yes, this is mid-90s SNK translations, but since I can't read Japanese, I can't really do anything but take what I'm seeing at face value. This is the layman's SNK content, okay? I think Fatal Fury 3 showcases Terry at his angriest. For a decade of his life, he trained for one goal, defeat Geese Howard. After finally accomplishing that, he ended up feeling like it was pointless. Then Geese's half-brother shows up in town, mind breaks him, he overcame it and defeated him in battle as well, and then he commits suicide right in front of him. Now more than ever, he feels like fighting is pointless. And then Geese comes back from the dead and threatens everyone Terry cares about that he hasn't already killed yet, with the prospect of him becoming literally immortal becoming a very real problem. No wonder Terry isn't all smiles and upbeat in this game. There's no cheerful Let's party! before a fight in this one. He just dead stares the opponent while twirling his hat. Compared to other Fatal Fury games, there feels like there's a lot more tension in the air. Even the character select tells you pretty much, shit is real this time. However, there is some light during the grim plot of Fatal Fury 3. This is where the series' favourite Blue Mary is first introduced, as a private detective investigating Geese's reappearance in the scrolls. She and Terry strike up a friendship during this time. Mary is interesting as she is Terry's first exposure to someone who has also had loved ones taken from her by Geese, and the two relate to each other from that. However, Mary always puts her job first and emotions second, unlike Terry, who's still running on pure anger. Eventually, Terry faces off against Geese, but he escapes once again at the end of their fiery battle. Despite wanting to chase after Geese, Terry is stopped by Cheng, who tells him to focus on the bigger issue, Yamazaki and the scrolls. For once, Terry puts his true ambitions to the side to do what's really needed. So at the end of it all, Geese manages to acquire all the scrolls despite everyone's efforts in Fatal Fury 3. And instead of using them for himself, he instructs Billy Kane to destroy them so nobody can use them against him. Then Geese does the only thing he can think of to celebrate, hosts a King of Fighters tournament. The original Fatal Fury story reaches its climax in real about Fatal Fury, where the final face-off between Terry and Geese takes place. With everything on the line, a grueling deathmatch takes place with both men giving it everything they've got. Eventually though, Terry takes the upper hand and knocks Geese off the tower once again with a devastating triple geyser. Wait a minute. Did Terry just try and save Geese? When this series' whole story is centered around the Bogards trying to get even? This scene is so iconic that I used to just accept it without question, and I think most people do that. But one time I was watching it and I realized, huh, why would Terry try and save Geese? And it bothered me ever since. Or at least it did, until I figured out why. Hardcore Fatal Fury fans would have noticed I completely glossed over something extremely important that happens at the end of Fatal Fury 3. Terry meets Geese's son, Rock Howard. 
I always thought it was weird that Terry finds Rock at the end of 3 instead of real battle. You know, you'd think that he'd adopt him after Geese kicks the bucket, but then I realised it's very important for Terry to adopt him before this scene. This marks a turning point in Terry's story. Upon meeting Mary and taking Rock under his wing, his eyes are open to the evil Geese has done outside of killing Jeff. He's a corrupt crime lord, endangering the innocent people of Southtown. He's played a role in countless tragedies and hits on innocent people. He's ignoring his dying wife and young son. This inspires Terry to let go of his selfish ambitions. From now on, he takes down Geese not for himself, but for the good of everyone. This is why he tries to save Geese at the end of Real Belt. He's learned that fighting for vengeance solves nothing. He wants Geese to answer for what he's done and try and make amends. However, Geese will always defy Terry at every turn. Originally, he was defying Terry's wishes for him to die by surviving his initial fall. And now that Terry wants Geese to live, he'll deny him one last time by swatting away his hand and falling to his death while laughing. There's no celebration after Geese dies. Terry just stares down from the top of Geese Tower. In his ending, we see him trying to adjust back to his regular life, but he's clearly in a bit of a mental rut. In the anniversary short, Terry laments that he and Geese could never seem to understand each other, and that matching fists was the closest they ever came to making any kind of connection. Terry is dejected in his railbow ending because he never could understand Geese's motivations or any of the decisions he made, and now he never will. Regardless of how he wanted it to go, the feud of Geese is finally over, and Southtown can enjoy a time of peace. He officially adopts Rock and decides to raise him to bury the rivalry once and for all. Eventually, he probably accepts Geese's death and moves past it, turning into the more cheerful and upbeat version of the character we see in all his other appearances like King of Fighters, Capcom vs SNK, Smash Bros, etc. And of course, Real Bout is the last canonical entry before we time skip to Mark of the Wolves period. I mean, if you want to be technical, Dominated Mind is debatably canon, but there's not really much to pick apart in it as far as Terry is concerned. I guess the one thing I could point out is that Terry is a sport and a big old grin on the character select in comparison to all the determined or indifferent scouts he's had on them so far, but I know that could be stretching things a bit. You know, as if I haven't done that enough in this video already. Something of note in Terry's character sound collection CD is how he talks about how his greatest hero and rival was his father, Jeff. He reminisces on how Jeff would fight in dark alleys in the streets where he and Andy would watch and root for him. He's always wishing he could get the chance to fight Jeff and prove himself, even saying that he's jealous of Andy having a rival to beat in himself. But instead of dwelling on it, I like to think that Terry raised Rock in the exact same way Jeff raised him, in order to carry on his legacy. Ten years after the events of Real Bout, the story picks back up with the first half of the 15th anniversary movie, Memories of Stray Wolves. Rock is now 17 and has developed his own fighting style mixing attributes of Terry and Geese together. We see them reminiscing over the events of the series so far at Pao Pao Cafe, while preparing to go to Second Southtown for the Maximum Mayhem tournament. Eventually an older version of Mary turns up and sits down for a chat, and this is where I want to clear up another odd thing about Terry. Him and Mary are clearly still not together here, despite being very obvious love interests for each other. It's strange considering SNK very rarely shies away from giving their flagship characters canon partners, especially recently with Andy and Mike getting together, Lily and Joe being still heavily referenced, Robert and Yuri, hell, even Yuki resurfaced in one of Kyo's KOF 15 endings. If SNK wants characters to be together, they will put them together. So how come Terry and Mary aren't a couple even though they're both clearly gagging for each other? In the previously mentioned character CD, Terry says that romance isn't really his thing. You could say it's indicative of his lone wolf lifestyle, but that didn't stop him from adopting a whole child. I've seen a ton of people question this. Thing is, there actually is an answer that makes sense. I present to the court this clip from Fatal Fury the Motion Picture. Poor guy. His lover was killed, did you know that? <sighs> I don't know all the details, and Andy never talks about it, but... Well, I guess it was about a year ago. She was trying to buy him time, and she was killed. He saw the whole thing. The fact that he couldn't protect her is tearing him up, you know? It hurts to see him sometimes. So you see, he's got this crazy idea any woman who falls in love with him is doomed. That's why he thinks he can never fall in love again. Now I understand. This is exactly why I decided to include Lily in my Fatal Fury 1 synopsis. It provides context as to why Terry is hesitant to get too close to Mary. He's afraid that anyone he loves will eventually die, like an irrational fear. Even with Geese gone, it's probably still a fear he wrestles with all these years later. And as for Mary, she's likely in the exact same situation, with two loved ones dying at the hands of Geese. Even in death, his evil presence is felt all the same. So, even though the two of them are pretty much perfect for each other and have such a good chemistry, unfortunately neither of them are willing to make the first move. 
All right, dry your fucking eyes. So we're coming up to the end of the video. Obviously, Mark the Walls is much more rock story, but there is one thing I want to talk about. As we all know, Terry received a kick-ass redesign for this game. And while I don't prefer it over his original design like most people do, I love it a lot and I gotta say, it is absolutely genius. Previously, I said Terry is an excellent example of communicating a character's personality, and in this case, development, through visual design. His Gera clothes aren't just a supremely sick fit, they represent who Terry has become now. The more muted browns of his jacket show that he's mellowed out significantly compared to when he was rocking the angry red vest. The regular boots instead of his classic converse give him an air of maturity. The lack of cap represents him passing the legendary hungry wolf torch the rock, just as Jeff had once done to him. And his hair being cut could also represent him letting go of his past. All this with him still looking and feeling extremely Terry Bogard. I mean shit, I don't know how they did it, but they sure knocked it out of the park with his older redesign. Damn shame it didn't get into Smash, but at least we have it in KOF 15. Anyway, I won't go into the plot of Mark of the Woods right now, you can wait for the Southdown chronology for that one. You might assume that the last we see of Terry is his Mark of the Walls ending, where he thinks about what Kane said to him regarding what it means to truly be alive. But actually, the last time we see Terry is during the ending of Memories of Stray Wolves, which takes place after Rock leaves with Kane. Terry is admiring the sunset and thinking about the events of the tournament before Mary dries up on a motorcycle. They briefly catch up, and Mary invites him to join her on a new case she's taken up. Though hesitant to break his lone wolf lifestyle, Terry finally decides to live for himself and takes Mary up on her offer. They drive off into the sunset, and that is the end of Terry Bogard's story. Phew, Jesus, that was a difficult one to script. Although I feel like I have to say that at the end of every video now. Anyway, what did you think? Let me know in the comments. I hope maybe my interpretation of the character made you appreciate Terry a little more or something to that effect. This video has been a long time coming and is one of the last topics I was itching to get off my chest ever since I started doing these SNK videos. So I'm glad it's finally out there. Oh yeah, uh, I have a Discord server. I a couple people have asked me if I have one, so you know, I might as well just stick the invite here. It'll also be in the description of the video, so you know, join up if you wanna, I don't know, talk. It's not the most interesting server in the world, but you'll get pinged every time I stream, or every time a video is uploaded, so it's a great way to keep up with my content. You know, after all the research I had to do for this video and fact checking and everything like that, I think I need to take a load off for the next video and cover something with a little less... I don't know the word... prestige, I guess? But, uh, huh. What should I look at? Hmm. Well, I'm sure I'll think of something. Stuff like that is why Archie Mega Man is pretty much my favorite video game out of the Even a total berating and sucker punch to the gut. Ow, fuck. I didn't realize my desk was in the way. Jesus Christ. I went to actually punch myself in the gut and I just scraped my thumb against my desk.